books are coming out. Ian, should I be able to, am I split screen between me and presentation or I'm just going to see my presentation? You'd have to um, exit the uh, full screen if you want to. Uh, Okay, that's okay. I just hopefully aren't cutting my head off or anything like that on the top of the screen if, if you can see me. So, um, hey, uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for taking a little bit of time uh, away from your summer evening to join us tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to, to get to talk a little bit to everybody and share a few thoughts. Uh, when the idea was presented around some, some topics to talk about, uh, coaching an individual sport, uh, there weren't uh, there weren't as many of the the ready-made topics, and I wanted to try and find something that would would not be too specific to obviously swimming or individual sport, but some things that can cross over. Um, but because the world I work in is is one of individual sport, that is the the lean that I'm going to take. Um, through this presentation and, and talking about individual performance in the team environment. So uh, um, I'll move along and, and we'll begin just a little bit by talking about your team environment. And before we can look at, at any manner of, of coaching, I think you have to take an assessment of, of what your environment is. And that might be anything from a, you know, a national center to a, a professional type environment to university to club and high school to to a developmental environment coaching um, you know more age group athletes I think one of the things that all of those have in common is they're going to have a mixture of talents and commitment and the effort of the athletes regardless of the level you coach at I think there are times when there's the perception that um, you know coaching, university athletes or, or coaching um, post-grad or international level athletes that, you know, they, they automatically are, are a little bit perfect um, and that they do everything just right and they try 100% at every moment and, and for the most part they do. Um, but, but generally you find similar challenges all the way across that spectrum. And so that's, I think, the first step is, is taking an assessment of what your coaching environment is. Um, because as you see with that little photo there, it's a, a nice boat they have, but it's, it's not gonna fit so well through underneath that bridge. And you may have, you might be the best coach in the, in the world, um, but if you're coaching at a developmental level, you cannot be trying to create a, a international environment within that developmental stage. So. Um, the, with all of those things uh, within your environment, you're going to have some, some limitations and some possibilities. And often I think those two things overlap quite a bit. Um, in terms of that, you know, you want to assess what type of facilities that you have. Um, do you have the facilities for world class performance or for national class performance? Are you in a developmental environment but you have a fantastic olympic sized ice facility at, at your disposal um, so the facilities are not always going to line up perfectly with the level you're coaching at but hopefully they're going to be close um, you want to look at your organizational support so do you have a organizational structure around you that is going to support the level that you're trying to to coach and perform at um, especially in a country like ours, uh, we have to look at, at geography. Um, when uh, sometimes within Canada, we, we bring in experts from other countries, and sometimes, uh, especially if they come from Europe, they've never faced a lot of the geographical challenges that we face, and whether that is, you know, that the best athletes are spread out across a huge country and trying to bring them together from a training perspective, the challenges around uh, travel uh, and those challenges, like all challenges right now, are obviously heightened a little bit more um, than they have in the in the past. But you know, it's one of the challenges we have within Canada West is 
we, we don't have any, you know, really easy travel. We certainly don't have any cross city tra travel. Um, and our, our shortest competition is, you know, a couple few hours drive. Uh, and that is something that affects and it can affect positively and negatively the, the programming you're running. The other part about geography, sometimes a little bit of isolation um, can be a really beneficial thing, I think, for uh, different types of programs. One of the other limitations and possibilities um, is what I'll call the level of performance threshold. And I think this is the uh, circumstance that often happens um, I think for athletes, but I think for coaches too, where we will, you know, you can sometimes only see as far or see it as, as high up as, as where someone has already gotten to. Um, and I think this, whether we're talking about um, any level of sport on the world level, people can, can see somebody running, you know, 9.6 seconds or, or so for the 100 meters but they can't, maybe track and field people can, but, uh, you know, until someone runs nine seconds, people might not be able to conceptualize that. It's interesting in the sport of swimming, uh, just over 10 years ago now, they eliminated the, uh, what they called the tech suits at the time. And these new swimsuits came out and absolutely revolutionized the sport. And, and one of the ways that revolutionized the sport was in terms of how fast you could swim. Um, and people, uh, world records were obliterated. Um, and then when those suits were, were banned, um, you know, there was lots of talk that, you know, some of these records, we might not even get back to them, uh, let alone how long will it take to get back to them. And what, ends up hap what ended up happening is, it, that level of performance threshold was was pushed, and then everybody works and aspires up to that. And on the the more micro scale, uh, that happens within you know clubs or or university teams or or high school teams or whatever it might be. If if the best player is a national qualifier, then people think that's what they're able to do. If that best player is a national finalist people think that they're they're able to do that so when you're when we're looking at performance within our team environment step one is is assessing that overall environment the next part of that is looking at and and assessing does your team environment match your coaching philosophy and your expectations and when i was thinking about this um, you know, that was, that's sort of the first part, as I say, is, is look at that, look at that fit. And then from there uh, saying, okay, I've, I, whatever your environment might be, um, does this match well with, with who I am as a coach, the type of program I'm trying to build, um, my, my long-term professional goals and that sort of thing. Um, and then does it match the expectations? And a lot of those expectations come not just from yourself, but from uh, the athletes and, and other bodies that surround you. From the, the programming standpoint um, and, and matching it to your environment, the, the few different things I looked at here is, is different approaches. And, you know, some, some approaches are the, the sort of one size fits all approach. And I think that, um, well, like all one size fits all things, it's going to fit some people perfectly. Um, and it's going to fit some people not as well, obviously. It is most likely, I think, the easiest thing to implement um, for, for coaches to, to come in and say, we are this type of a program. We are a, a, a sprint program. and this, this is how everyone's going to fit into this mold. Um, and again, it's going to fit some people perfectly. If you're coaching young people, they're going to improve within any program, um, certainly while they're growing. Um, but it's not going to be the best fit for everybody. Depending on your environment, though, you might not have a choice. You might be limited by 
your facility space or the amount of time that you can access, um, your budget perhaps, your equipment that you're able to access, where you might say, we'd love to be able to run different programs for different groups of athletes or different individuals, but our environmental constraints mean that everyone is gonna be a, a sprinter in our program. Um, and then, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you can be running highly personalized programming. Now, I think that that's also at the end of the spectrum that probably works towards, you know, more uh, international or professional level level competition, um, where individual athletes or or athletes within team programs are getting um, more one on one or, or personalized programming. Um, but it still has to be something that's possible within your environment. So offering personalized programming where everyone in your group is going to do something different, but you don't have the space to accommodate that, that's a great program, but, but is it going to fit? Um, and, and then the hybrid aspect. And I think, you know, if, this is where I think for most sports um, and certainly below high performance level, this is, this is where we find ourselves of, of trying to meet the needs of the greater group um, and at the same time trying to, to um, identify individual and specific or, or individual things that are going to help um, maybe just help one person in some cases, I guess. The other part of the programming is uh, aligning um, the coach and the athlete uh, and team goals and expectations. And what I mean by that is, you know, once you've evaluated your environment and once you've found what kind of programming is gonna fit within that environment, uh, if, if I am running a sprint program and I have everything set up for that and a fantastic distance swimmer um, says I wanna move, move and swim at Lethbridge and these are my goals to, my goal is to make the Olympic team well, that might be a really exciting thing for a coach to say, yeah, yeah, let's go. Um, you have to look and go, well, your goal is to make the Olympic team in a distance, distance event, and we're running a sprint program here. Um, so those things all have to, have to line up. And, and on, on that expectation front, I think, and from the coaching standpoint, um, this, you know, probably maturity more than, and time more than anything else helps you um, better manage expectations. Um, but, but those things, you know, the coach and the athlete, those are often the easiest expectations to align. Sometimes the challenge is, is a little bit more external um, and having a board of directors or institutional support or support, depending on your, your circumstance, Sometimes coaches, you know, don't necessarily have to answer to, um, but but want to encourage their supporters to be supportive, um, and this this sometimes can impact with expectations um, and and make it a little bit more difficult to think, keep things steering in the right direction, so to speak. So. Um, Ian, you'll give me a heads up if any questions pop up. Uh, and otherwise, I am just going to keep talking. I'm pretty used to doing Zoom stuff. It's how we've adjusted our swim practices um, for quite some time. But usually when I'm doing Zoom with the swimmers, I can see everybody and see what they're doing. So it's, uh, it's different to, uh, to just be talking into space. So... Um, I wanted to just touch on on team and individual sport a little bit, and this would be a, a series of presentations in itself to talk about the difference between between team and individual sport. Um, and I had just found a short a short video, um, a couple minute video. But when Ian and I were testing this out, we had a couple a little bit of problem just on the screen sharing. So I'm going to skip past that, but what the video was about, it was just two high school, two uh, female high school athletes, and one of them was a soccer player and one of them was a golfer. 
and they talked a little bit about you know the differences in their sports and they obviously talked a little bit about the similarities in their sports um, and it was interesting because you know one of the girls said well I was originally attracted to to golf in her case because I wasn't that tall and so she you know talked about a physical attribute and and its impact in her finding her sport and then she also talked about being a little bit quieter and more reserved and and so it was that physical aspect but then her her personality qualities also seem to match well and the young lady who was a soccer player talked first about being attracted to to soccer from the team aspect and, and being part of a group and that kind of thing um the other little link i had on there was just this thing from uh, bbc news and it was uh, how to choose a sport and it had i think nine questions and they were all just a scale, you know, are you shorter or taller? Are you powerful or less powerful in this? And, and by completing these nine questions, it would assess what sport you should do. But it obviously only talked, or not obviously, but it only talked about the physical characteristics of somebody. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about sort of that difference between the physical and the personality part of things. Uh, Neil... Coach Neil might be interested in my profile. It said I should be a rugby sevens player. Um, but I think that was taking into account my age a little too much because I don't think I have the speed for rugby sevens. So um, when we look at team and individual sport, you know, there's, there's obviously great commonalities that go far beyond the couple of things I've listed here. But for the purpose of what we're talking about, um, Individual performance is part of all sport. Uh, if, if anybody can, can shine a light on something um, where that's not the case, please, please share it with me. But I, I really did try and rack my brains and go, can I think of a sport where, where it's, you know, team sport is not simply the sum of individual performances, but, but I think it is a part of all, all sport. Um, most sport, takes place in some type of a team environment. Uh, and that may seem obvious to the team sport folks, but um, even individual sport, I think with very rare exceptions, and again, getting to the highest level, is taking part in, or taking place in some type of team environment. Um, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but, and I'll talk a tiny bit more, but, but you know, I, I, I'm a parent, and so I used to think, or I still think, I hope that, that my kids have an aptitude for a sport that they enjoy. Um, because, you know, there are times for everybody, maybe they have a great aptitude for a sport, but they just don't like it. Um, you know, maybe it's an individual sport and they need people around or vice versa. But I think um, that we don't necessarily think about that and go, okay, well, what are their physical attributes while well, they're long limbed and they're this and they're that. Um, but what are the what are their personality attributes and which, you know, what sport is going to feed that part of them more. And when we recognize that most people are not going to play sports at an international level or get paid to play sport or anything like that, finding that sport that's going to be a good fit uh, mentally and emotionally is probably at least as important as finding one that's going to be a good fit uh, physically. So, um, Once we go through and start that process and we've evaluated our environment and we found if things are going to match um, and uh, I, our next step moving on I think is, and again, regardless of team or individual sport, is uh, finding some common ground. And I think that, again, in team sports, and, and I don't coach traditional team sports. Um, I don't pretend to, to uh, well, I'm by no means an expert there, um, but I, I have assumptions and I'm around sport a lot. But the I think finding the common ground for a traditional team sport is a little bit easier process um, because for the most part that team is going to is going to win or or lose 
Um, and everybody goes through that same thing. I think when you're finding common ground in individual sports, th there is obviously common ground. Um, and in some circumstances, it, it's quite a bit more significant than others. So, and that's why I like these two, two pictures there. They're both pulling hard. Everybody's trying their best, but, but one is a, a little bit more as a team. And this wasn't an age-based thing at all. The other one looks a little bit more as a, a collect collection of individuals. And they're all pulling, um, but not everybody is going about it the same way and, and maybe not in unison. So I think when we're looking to find that, that common ground, um, which I think is, is a big part of, of teamwork, and get people pulling together and pulling in the same direction, um, there's different ways to, to go about finding that. In a situation where you're coaching um, individuals who are, who are competing in a university sport, and, and there's a couple examples of that, um, and the two examples we have at Lethbridge are, are swimming and track and field, the, there is more of a team aspect than there is in sort of traditional or most swimming and track and field. And what I mean by that is, you know, within the university environment, we have dual meets, we have championship meets, we have things like that. And we have in those circumstances, um, individuals that sort of play roles a little bit more. And I think in, in most traditional team sports, you know, athletes, um, all have fairly defined roles. The, the, the playing football is football, but what a quarterback does is, is very different than what a, a lineman does, even though they're playing the exact same sport. Within, within individual sports that do have a, a team aspect to them, um, it's much more about the sum of the parts. Um, but We've all seen examples and, and in individual sports, you know, sometimes we'll talk about the, the first person who races in a competition and they're going to set the tone. And one of the things that they'll do, you know, if somebody goes out and maybe they're not going to be the highest score, but they swim a personal best and they make an improvement. Well, the person in the next heat who maybe is their training partner, you know, in theory is going to be motivated by that, right? And think, Hey, I, I did what they did in practice. I actually beat them on most of the sets we were swimming. You know, they just swam faster than my best time. I'm feeling pretty good about this. And obviously that can, can go in the other direction as well. Um, with those common ground things, um, sometimes as I say, they think they come a little bit more easily, sometimes not as easily. Um, and when you're dealing with athletes that a high performance level. Um, I think there's there's less of those things. Um, they're not competing necessarily for a team unless it's Canada, um, where they're you know when athletes are going to say a, a trials competition or something like that. Most of them would like to see their teammates succeed, but their their focus gets quite a bit more specific. So, um, as I said, when when I thought about this topic, I thought about it first from, from my perspective, from the coach's perspective. Um, but then one of the things I did is I talked to some of the athletes that I coach uh, about, you know, what I was going to talk about. And I, I wanted some of their feedback on things. And there were, um, again, this could be a whole presentation and quite likely a better one. Um, to, to do all of this simply from the athlete's perspective. Um, but that's not the one I'm doing today. But there were a couple of really great things that I wanted to share from athletes. Um, and the three things I'll sum them up into. The first is learning to, to enjoy others' success and use it to help you. Um, I think that I wrote maturity in the next one, but I think this demands obviously a certain amount of maturity um, to, to be able to do that. And, but for the athletes that were able to, to enjoy the success of their teammates, um, 
it was motivating for them. Uh, they found, as a, you can see there, it reinforced um, their preparation and their good habits. And in some case, cases, it would help direct them uh, towards or away other behaviors. And so, you know, if they see somebody succeeding and that's the person who eats better than anybody else on the team and they know they've got, uh, they could, could eat a little bit less fast food, that might be something where they go, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn from what they're doing. Um, the other part of that is, is sharing. Um, and I didn't have a better way to put this than talking shop, as I wrote there. But this is one of the great things that I, I see more from our older athletes. Um, and I coach a wide spectrum of athletes. I coach um, young high schoolers um, all the way up to, to post-grad athletes. So the age spectrum I coach is, you know, like 14 to, to well into their 20s. Um, and often we have these people training together, which, which is its own unique set of challenges. But having some mature athletes and older athletes who have gone through many of these experiences and the experiences you know, of watching a teammate succeed or, uh, or themselves not succeeding or, or whatever it might be, having those type of people around to, to share their experiences and that kind of thing is fantastic. And, and not just to share their experiences, but, you know, I think we have a pretty good environment where the athletes, you know, um, they're almost experiential in, in their, their um, communicating with each other and, and trying to, they're, they're like an assistant coach a little bit. Um, one of the other really good thoughts I got was from athletes was and this i think if you're in a larger environment becomes maybe more important but creating a, a micro environment um and so if you're in a training group and maybe you've got 40 people in your training group it's not realistic to think that all 40 of them are going to be pulling together every day um with with the same goals in mind and so within that group creating a little bit of a bubble um, finding your training partners, the people who are going to support what, what you're trying to do there. Sometimes those people are going to be your competitors. Um, sometimes they're, they're going to be friends. Sometimes they're not friends. Sometimes your best training partner is not your best friend. Uh, and sometimes your best friend is, is somebody who should not be your training partner. I think that's uh, Franco Colombo and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger there who are, I believe, uh, famous training partners. And I wondered if part of why that was is because they competed in, in different weight classes and maybe that made them good training partners because they were in competition but not as direct competition. So, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about communicating with athletes um, in training and in competition. And I chose that picture there um, the, the one fellow winning, the one fellow losing. And the reason I chose it is that can literally be, um, like there, there's moments where I know for myself and, and I think for other coaches where you're coaching both of the athletes in that picture. Um, and again, from the more individual sports, if you're, if the team wins, the whole team wins. Um, the person who, who was the leading scorer and played the most minutes, they won the same way as the person who maybe maybe didn't get on the ice still won. Um, and when you talk to that room and group of athletes, they all shared in that experience of winning um, or losing. Um, they might not all feel the same way about it, um, but they all that part is common. There's times where as a coach of an individual sport, as I say, you may be the coach of both of those athletes. And those two athletes come back to you and, uh, and you want to give one a high five and great job and the other one you want to give a pat in the back. And sometimes they're literally standing there in front of you together. Um, so the, the daily, not just daily in training, but in, in competition too, 
the mix of experiences equals the number of athletes. And in all honesty, it's probably like the number of athletes squared because everybody's experience is not just one thing. Um, within a practice, somebody might have a great, a great set or a great drill or a great part of that practice. They may also have a, a not so great you know, aspect. They might have a fantastic practice from start to finish, but they look over at one of their teammates and they're like, boy, they beat me on, I did a great job today, but they beat me on, on all the things we did. And all of a sudden, that fantastic practice they just had, they, they might start giving themselves a little bit different message. Um, so recognizing that, that those experiences are, are different across the whole, the whole group of people, of athletes, um, try and create a, a variety and levels of success that can be achieved every day. Um, so if you program just to your very top swimmer and say every interval is going to be on, on this, this pace and everybody's doing the same thing, well, th again, the one size fits all. There's going to be some people that's going to fit pretty well, but there's going to be a lot of people that go through all of those same things, but they don't really have an opportunity to be, to be successful. Um, maintaining the common ground. I think that Early in seasons and things, coaches do really great jobs of, of team building and, and teamwork exercises and these kind of things. And I think that once we get into training mode, um, it's really easy to get away from some of those things. So reminding yourself of what are the things that everybody here is working towards, um, because there always are common ground things. It doesn't matter what the diversity of the group of athletes you coach is. They're, they all want to improve. There's your common ground. Um, different targets within the training environment. And this is a really tough one. Um, and again, everybody's situation is a little bit different, but there's often times where we're coaching people towards different targets or different competitive focuses. Um, and you may have a group of athletes and this athlete is getting ready for trials and this athlete is getting ready for a, a championship meet that's not at the trials athlete or a level and this group of athletes are getting ready for provincials and and this group of athletes are getting ready for university championships um and it's often a challenge for coaches and athletes. It's, it's so nice when everybody is, is on the same train and going towards the same place and can be sort of experiencing that together. Um, and it's great when it happens. But the reality is many times we've got trains going in all kinds of different directions and, and you're trying to, to go on each one of those with the athlete or the group of athletes um, and it's, it's hard to manage those, those different targets and some people who are four weeks out and others that are six weeks out and, and keeping everybody focused on where they should be. And that leads into that next one of the, the competitive focus and, and the role. Um, you know, we, we have here in Lethbridge, you know, we have people training to, to represent Canada. Uh, we have people training to represent the university. We have people training to to represent Lethbridge and and every one of those levels. Um, as as I say, they sometimes they sometimes um, overlap and, and train together quite a bit. And you know whether someone's competing at the Olympic level or someone's competing at the Alberta Summer Games, it's equally valid uh, and equally important to that person. And, and, you know, we have to try and, and keep them focused on, as I say, what their target is. And the role aspect of that is, um, again, in individual sports, I think the, the role part is not quite the same. Um, although when we do get to some of those championship competitions, I think that part does change a little bit. So, um, the other parts uh, in training, and, and I guess I talked about a little bit of these in the previous screen, but when, when we have that sort of full team, um, as I say, creating the opportunities for everyone to be successful, um, and if that can 
happen on a daily basis that's a lot better. Finding those commonalities, we're all striving for improvement, we're all, we're all trying to climb, climb another rung, um, providing the clear targets that even though they might not be all pulling together at the same time for the exact same thing, this group knows they're training towards this and knows where they are in their, in their training program and another group might be at a different point in that continuum, they know where they are. One of the things I think is hard for athletes, it's, you know, some people are doing different things um, and they don't know why. Um, and no coach is trying to, you know, keep anything secret and say, well, I'm going to have you do this training and, and we're keeping this other training from you. Coaches want to do what, what's going to help the athletes be the most successful. Um, and, and I think we make those choices, but it's important to help the athletes understand, no, there's a reason why, you know, I want you to do distance swimming, even though you really like sprinting. Um, you, th this is where your aptitude lies. Um, and then moving into available roles. Um, and again, I think this is different at different levels, but certainly within a university environment, you know, say we have, have relays. Uh, well, there's four spots on a relay. And, you know, an athlete might look and go, well, those top two guys, those, those I'm not going to get there. Uh, and that third guy, but, you know, like, I'm not far off that fourth spot. And, and you know, I would like that role. I want to be on that relay. Um, and that might be an individual who's trying to get the fourth spot on the relay who maybe isn't even going to make a final at, at a, say, a championship meet uh, yet. But as a part of that relay, they might be on the podium. Um, and so those roles can be extremely motivating. Um, and then if you've got four guys that are trying for that fourth role in training every day, now they're going to push each other. There's going to be a lot of some rivalry issues to deal with, but, but that's a really great motivating factor. Um, and sort of, I guess, similar to maybe what you have on a team sport where people are competing for a, a starting position or something like that. Um, the other part from the, the little bit smaller groups within the training environment, uh, looking at, at teammates and training partners and competition, there's a lot of times where certainly in club sport, um, age group sport, where teammates are in direct competition with each other. Um, and that can be great as we just talked about, guy, you know, some people trying to get that fourth relay spot. But that can be really, really tough, especially when you're talking about um, younger athletes and you're talking about athletes that are at different stages in, in growth and development. And, you know, we see there's a lot of reason kids drop out of sports, whether it be these days or in previous generations. Um, but one of the, you know, you think of early developers who then have to face getting passed by, by other people. Um, you know, those kind of things are really, really difficult. And then if that's not just about competition, but that actually is happening every day within, within the training environment, um, it's really important for, for coaches to, to recognize those things. It might be sometimes a coach's instinct to say, oh, I'm going to take these two swimmers or these two track athletes. They both do the same event. They're both similar and in their in their uh, results let's have them go and race head to head and and this seems like a great idea to us and you know it may be that one of them you know is just getting hammered down every single time and another another level of self-confidence is being taken away so we want to we want to create great training situations um but we want to make sure there's we're looking out for those athletes. Ian, I see you're not muted. Does that mean you get, there's a question? Yeah, we, uh, we have a question for you, Peter. Um, cool. What tips do you have to enable an athlete to accept a role change that fits better with their aptitude when the role might seem less glamorous? That's a great question. Um, so I'm going to answer that, obviously, or no, I'm going to answer that from, from the swimming perspective. And I'm trying to think of a, an example of that where somebody would maybe move into a role that might be more supportive 
um, and it's, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example before I can think of, of as I say, some suggestions. I think that, um, you know, athletes' roles within their team environments are pretty fluid most of the time. Um, if you're the if you're the backup quarterback behind Tom, Tom Brady, I guess your role is not very fluid. Um, but for most, you know, as I say, things are changing, right? They're they're growing and developing at different rates. The you know who who was the fastest breaststroker at the last swim meet might not be the fastest breaststroker at, at this next meet. And so it wouldn't be until, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what, there's been times with some swimmers where swimming has quite a crossover to triathlon. And we've had a couple of really great examples in Lethbridge of individuals who are much better triathletes than they were swimmers. Um, and I think, you know, it's not my job to tell someone what sport they should be doing, but I think it is a coach's role you know, to help people find their best opportunity for success. So that might be a little bit more at the extreme end of answering that question, where there's circumstances of, you know, hey, you you have a great attitude and a great work ethic and all of these skills, and and you might actually be better suited to, you know, a different sport. Um, and then, yeah, we have, um, you know, we have circumstances, I guess, yeah, where somebody maybe is our, is our incumbent incumbent person uh, as our our top backstroker and our relay swimmer for the horns, and then uh, incoming rookie comes in and and displaces them from that role. Um, you know, the the best tip in that case is remember that you were that incoming rookie a few years ago, and you wanted so badly to displace you know this person, and and you did that. Right. And then and remember how they uh, acted. And I guess that's, you know, maybe that person acted fantastic. And and uh, they were a great role model for this person to say, I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, be that way with this this uh, young upstart. And maybe that person didn't act so well. And that person remembers that, you know what, they they really they really made me feel bad. Um, and I don't want I don't want to do that to somebody else. So sorry for the long-windedness and uh, if I didn't hit the target right on, but that would be my, my tip on that. So um, just the other couple other things, and if, if you wanted any more, please let me know. Um, the couple other things on, on training partners and that kind of thing, and again, depending on your environment, um, you could have different genders be training partners. We have a situation here in Lethbridge where we've got an Olympic finalist um, woman, Rachel Nickel, um, her best training partners uh, in our group are actually a couple of the of the men, um, and and they that works really really well. Um, and and then this sort of speaks about the uh, the micro environment or the bubble that some of the athletes talked about, but you know that supportive and collaborative environment. Um, and those are things where you know we as coaches I think have to have to provide. The environment for that we maybe have to have to plant the seeds for that a little bit but that's something that really needs to to grow amongst the athletes so um so moving to competition and uh i was really happy when i found this i was looking for a tree in a forest and then i found a forest picture inside a stadium so i was like that's just perfect um so you know when we look at going into competition and and where we actually you know get a measure of of performance there's such great differences amongst amongst the different sports and things that i think are really important to to keep in mind and i'm sure i missed some sports in terms of the full team but you know you look at the number of athletes per side and then you double that number of athletes for how many people are are playing at one time and within all of those you know, there's varying dependence on the others for success. And that's, you know, the best players team doesn't always win. Um, so it's, it's, and even the team with the two best players maybe doesn't necessarily win. There has to be, um, there has to be a, a cohesive um, 
team, team environment and they have to work together and people play different roles. Um, there's one quarterback and there's one, one uh, goalie and there's one of these things. Um, there might be different, multiple people playing those roles, but even within that, you know, there's one third line center on the hockey team, not three third line centers on the hockey team. When, when people go and play, um, as I say, they generally will win or lose as a group, but sometimes there's even sort of those, those smaller groups within that where, you know, the defense might have a great game, um, but maybe not the offense. So even sometimes within those team sports, while it's not winning, there's still success, whether it be individual or part of the team, that that happens there despite of the final or despite the final outcome in the individual sports they kind of break down into two different ways and that's individual sports that are competing in some type of a group and those types of groups change if you're running in the boston marathon i guess you're running with tens of thousands of other people if you're playing tennis, um, you're playing against one other people, person, or, or perhaps two people playing against two other people. And so even though those are individual sports, you know, sort of how the spotlight shines on the person changes, changes depending on that. It's a lot easier, I guess, unless you're winning, to get lost within that larger group running. Whereas if you're, if you're, playing uh, tennis with somebody there's only two of you uh, you can assume half the half the crowds watching one of you at, at all of the time uh, and you're generally playing the same role um, and then the other part of the individual sports competing are, are those sports that compete one at a time um, you know in an example being more the demonst or not demonstration sports but uh, the judge sports, figure skating or gymnastics, um, diving, things like this. And I'll tell you what, like, I think from, from the sport I coach in swimming, I often think about um, the challenge for an athlete to just get up on the blocks and have a go. Um, and, and doing that within a, a group of eight people or whatever. And, and you know that there's anxiety that comes with that and some of that athletes can channel in in great ways and some of it takes a lot more a lot of practice to channel but those sports where golf i guess is another one where it's it's you by yourself um and you're the only one who has that role um you know when in figure skating um they skate different programs so you're the only person doing that role taking on that challenge or diving wherever you know sure there's commonalities but people have have different things they're trying to do and i think that i i see there's a question just give me one second that that again recognizing in competition what the athletes are facing and we prepare them i think we do a great job preparing them but you know i know for myself you know, we prepare a lot from the physical standpoint and the race planning and all of these things, but I don't have a ton of conversations with people and go, what do you think about from the five minutes from when you walk from here until you get behind the blocks? And, and I think those are, are really important things um, and, and they play a huge role. So, uh, Ian? Yeah, do you... Do you find value in team building activities and bring the group together despite the individual atmosphere? Yeah, for sure. So in, in swimming, um, you know, and I think in any, any, uh, sport is hard. Um, and in team sports, sometimes as we said, you can share that amongst other people, but we have things in, in swimming and some of them happen, you know, when we do, obviously it's pretty hard for people to talk when their faces are in the water. So those things happen around the periphery of swim practice before or after swim practice. They happen in the, in the, the, um, the weight room when, when we're doing some dry stuff, they happen at our, you know, preseason uh, goal setting meetings. And when we, we sit down and review those kind of things um, and, and they, 
you know, the, as I say, a lot just happens in that sort of before and after time frame when we, we, get to, uh, we get to define a little bit more who we are than, than as I say, when everybody is looking at a black line on the bottom of the pool. So, um, and this is actually my last slide. And, uh, you know, this is sort of something that stemmed a little bit from the conversation I had with, with some of the athletes. And, you know, one of the things that came up in those conversations is, you know, talking about, you know, it can be difficult when somebody beats you and you, you especially if it's your training partner or teammate, you know exactly um, what you each have done. Um, and, you know, hard work pays off, but that doesn't mean it wins. And it is a really hard thing, not just for young athletes, but I think for some fairly mature athletes um, to, to, to understand that it's not always just and that, that's, you know, sport is not a measure of, of 10 times 3,000 running and it's not a measure of who tried hardest and it's not a measure of, of just talent for that matter. It's a measure of all of these things together. Um, but as I say, especially for young athletes, and I remember I wasn't a good athlete, but I remember, you know, trying hard and then you'd get beat and think, you know, but, but my mom and dad said hard work pays off and my coach said hard work pays off and that person doesn't work nearly that hard and, and yet they're successful. Um, and this is part of sport, right? And it's part of, um, we want to, this picture that's on here, um, you know, and I assume the story that went with this was true, but this lady from a, a particular part of Mexico that is famous for their distance runners and, a, and with no training and running in her sandals and, and obviously a, a skirt won the, won the 50 kilometer race, you know, and, and there's, there's just no, you know, there's no explaining that part of it. Um, and I think the, the important message that goes with this to athletes is, you know, the first part, hard work does pay off just, just because somebody may be more successful from the outcome standpoint, uh, or, or may just have more talent. Um, as we talked about at the beginning, the, the things people are going to get from sport, um, only a very few people get to that high performance level. So for the great, great majority, it's all of those other lessons that go around sport. And, and we talk about the life lessons that come with sport. Um, you know, if people, if people work hard, they're going to improve and they're going to get better and they're going to learn about themselves and they're going to accomplish great things. Um, and if somebody else has a lot of talent, they might win, um, but they might miss out on some of those other things that, that hard work hard work uh, taught along the way. So, um, you know, we, we want to, we want to explain to our athletes and, and, uh, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, that's just, you know, all the other things being said, we can coach them up, we can do the right things, we can create the right environment. Um, but, but, there's, there's some things we don't have control over. And, uh, and those are things is whether it's a, your coach or a parent, uh, those are some of the things we've got to teach, teach our athletes, teach our kids. So there you go. Um, we, any other questions right now? We do have one in there now and, and we'll give people a, a minute or so as well to, to ask any other questions if they do have it. But the one we do have right now is what are your thoughts on utilizing assistant or volunteer coaches when it comes to coaching the individual? Well, I think uh, they're great. Um, I mean, co all, all coaches will, will, uh, would want to take advantage of having, you know, more coaching resources available to them. And, you know, from the example we have at the university, you know, my role is as head coach of, of the pronghorn program and LASC, um, like, uh, but I have, you know, an assistant coach and for the last couple of years, that's been Josh Sorensen. And, you know, he, he, you know, has an important role. 
Uh, we've got a great, you know, high performance and strength training program. I consider, consider, you know, Heidi and Jesse assistant coaches from that standpoint. Um, they have a, a role to play. And, and uh, yeah, so no, assistant coaches are, as long as, I think it's the same thing as the team of athletes. You would like to have common ground and you would like to be pulling in the same direction. And that's the same thing you want from your, your coaching um, team and your IST team is that, that everybody is consistent with the message and is working towards the you know, same and similar outcomes. So yeah, no head coach can uh, do it on their own. That's for certain. Okay, we'll just give a minute here to see if somebody else has a question before before we uh, officially end. Um, but obviously, thank you, Peter, for for your presentation tonight. Um, it was great to to hear your your thoughts on on the individual and team components. Um, just while we wait, uh, we'll also mention next week uh, we will bring in Josh Hootmeyer, who is the mental performance consultant at ASD Southwest. He is also a consultant with the Saskatoon Blades of the WHL and the Vauxhall Academy of Baseball. And he previously has spent some time with Hockey Canada and he will present mental performance, what it is and how to integrate it. Peter, I think we're good. So thank you very much again. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening.